Thank you, Gary Taubes, um, for joining us on Vitalstoff blog. Um, this is um, a show, this is a site where uh, readers and listeners get information on um, science and, and uh, information on medicine, which is not quite in the mainstream. So I think um, we have a very, very interesting um, guest today. Um, Gary, you are um, co-founder of the Nutrition Science Initiative. Uh, you are an, a science journalist, uh, very uh, highly um, decorated. So you have received, I think you're the only journalist who has received the Science and Journalism um, Award um, three times um, for your work, which uh, at least for the past um, 10 or 15 years, has centered very much around the issue of um, obesity um, and um, connected health problems such as um, diabetes. And your, um, your main point in your latest book has been the case against sugar. But it, well, in fact, it did start with um, a story about sugar, didn't it? Well, the latest book started with a story about sugar. The, my nutrition research started actually 20 years ago with uh, an investigative piece for the journal Science on the question of whether salt uh, is the cause of high blood pressure, hypertension. And that was my learning experience in how nutrition researchers go about the process of trying to establish reliable knowledge and how they do it somewhat perversely. Right. But, uh, as a science journalist, you, you did not start in nutrition. You originally, you are a trained um, physicist, I understand. So you, you uh, started with all kinds of uh, investigative uh, journalistic pieces um, within the wider area of, of science. Um, maybe uh, you can give us some background on, on, uh, on, on, your, on your work. Um, in okay, so I have a, an undergraduate degree in physics, but I wasn't very good at it. Uh, graduate degrees in engineering and then journalism. And when I started journalism, I, I started my career as a science journalist because that was what my background was. And in uh, 1984, I went off to write my first book at CERN, the big physics lab outside of Geneva, and I thought I was going to be covering a great breakthrough. The physicist who won the Nobel Prize when I was there and later became director general of CERN was telling the world that he was on to the greatest breakthrough in physics in 40 years, and all he had to do was turn it on his accelerator and get a little more data and nail it down. And I asked him if I could go live with the experiment. We would, today we would say to be embedded with the physicists on the experiment and write a book about this great breakthrough. It's rare that people predict breakthroughs. I now know why they don't, because until you've got all the data and dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, you don't actually know if you've discovered anything. So I went off to CERN and I watched, realized pretty soon after I got there that this discovery was very questionable. And then I spent 10 months watching this collaboration of 150 physicists realize how they had screwed up and how they had gotten things wrong. So the book that originally was going to be about a great breakthrough became an expose about the culture and politics of big science. Um, and it got me obsessed with this question of how easy it is to get the wrong answer in science and how hard it is to do it right. And once that became my obsession, those are the kind of stories I was attracted to. My second book, which was called Bad Science, was on a similar issue uh, in nuclear physics. Uh, I did a few exposés along the way. And after my second book, my friends in the physics community said, if you're interested in bad science, you should look at the stuff in public health because it's terrible. And so I started writing about public health. And it turned out that in particular, uh, the question of whether electromagnetic fields from power lines cause uh, cancer at the time, brain cancer, leukemia, this idea is still with us, with the, the idea that 
uh, cell phones can cause cancer. And it turned out that all this rigorous, uh, critical methodology that I had been taught in the physics community was absolutely fundamentally necessary to establish reliable knowledge, to make sure that you're not fooling yourself, was considered a luxury in public health research, simply too difficult to do, and so you didn't have to do it. And as a result, from my perspective, that means you couldn't trust any of the findings in public health research, um, unless you actually saw evidence of rigorous testing of ideas, rigorous experimental clinical trials. And then again, in the late 90s, I moved into nutrition. I kind of stumbled into it by accident. I was believed the conventional thinking on diet and health as everyone did. And uh, I stumbled into this controversy over whether salt causes high blood pressure. And a lot of people don't realize that this has always been a very controversial position, even though we've been told to eat low salt diets for 30, 40 years now. But the evidence to support that has always been very weak. And then while doing that story for the journal Science was a piece that took me nine months and I interviewed something like 80, 85 researchers and administrators for one magazine article. Um, one of the worst scientists I'd ever interviewed in my life took credit not just for getting Americans in the world to eat a low salt diet, but for getting us to eat this low fat diet we'd all been eating since the mid 1980s. And my experience in physics was that bad scientists never get the right answer. It's just science is too hard. This guy was clearly uh, uh, among the worst scientists I'd ever interviewed in my life. And I thought I'd interviewed some of the very worst, particularly in my second book. And uh, I launched into an investigation of the idea that dietary fat caused heart disease and we should all be eating a low-fat diet. I had no preconceptions other than this thinking that if this one researcher was involved, there must be a good story there. And that's now eaten up the last 20 years of my life. <laughs> right. And um, so uh, this issue about why we get fat is of course um, jumping right into today's conversation. Um, your book, um, Why We Get Fat, has just uh, appeared um, in the German language. Um, Warum wir uh, dick werden is the title um, in German. It's it's not your latest book, and maybe we can uh, also touch on your uh, most recent um, publication. But let's let's uh, let's stick with why we get fat for, for a moment. Um, there in this book, you, um, you uh, go on um, very historically. So um, why is it necessary or why is it your, your style to, to take the reader uh, through a historical process? What, what is the advantage of, of this approach? Well, it's interesting. And remember, I was... My undergraduate degree was in physics, and my first books were in physics and nuclear physics. Um, in physics, you learn the science with the history attached. So if you think about it, and in part because as the science progresses, it gets more and more complicated. So the older it is, the easier it is to understand. But you learn about you know, Newton's gravity and the Maxwell's equations and Einstein's relativity. And as you're learning new concepts, you're also learning what experiments were done to test these hypotheses back before they became accepted theories and what the evidence was pro and con. And that's part of the process of learning how to do physics is learning how to test hypotheses and part of the process of learning what to believe in physics is learning what the evidence was. And in medicine and public health and nutrition, we, for the most part, none of that happens. I don't quite understand why, maybe because we're trying to communicate too much information too quickly. But in medicine in particular, you're taught what to believe, you're not taught why you believe it and the history of the ideas. So when I started my investigations into the SALT hypothesis and the FAT hypothesis, the reasonable way to do it, it seemed to me, was to 
go back in time to the point at which they were still very controversial, like a legal case when both sides of the case are presenting their strongest evidence. And you could then get the evidence that was presented back then. So you're seeing the, the evidence for and against these hypotheses. And then you could dig into those papers and dig into those references and go backwards in time to see how sound the assumptions were that these arguments were based on. And so the process naturally brings you backwards in time. And then you start building it back up again from there. So that was how I thought about it as an investigative journalist. Um, as it turned out, as I went back in time, you discover the existence of other hypotheses, competing explanations for, the, for what you're trying to explain. And in obesity in particular, this question, why we get fat, I had no idea about this when I first started. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so surprised it took so long to get any of my books translated into German. When I went back in time, it turned out that prior to World War II, and I knew nothing of this. Remember, I'm an investigative journalist working in the physics world. Um, prior to World War II, all major, excuse me, the, the forefront of modern, of medical science, uh, the best medical science, well, the best science in the world period was being done in Germany and Austria pre-World War II. And uh, a lot of it was driven by Jewish researchers, um, the lingua franca of medicine, medical science back then was German. And if you wanted to do serious medical research prior to World War II, you either, you had to at least read German. So you could read the German language literatures or you had to, uh, ideally you spoke it as well. So you could come to Europe and train with the authorities who tended to be Germans and Austrians, not exclusively, but predominantly. And German and Austrian researchers pre-World War II had a different perspective on obesity. And they had come to be convinced by the idea that obesity had to be a hormonal regulatory disorder. So the way we've thought about it since the 1960s or so is that it's an energy balance problem. It's calories in, calories out. That's all you have to know. If somebody gets fat, it means they're eating too much or they're sedentary. This is a sort of bedrock belief in the medical community. You could find a line to this effect on virtually every medical website in the world about the cause of obesity. It's caused by consuming more calories than we expend. It's an unbelievably naive way to think about it, even though that's how I thought about it until I started my research. The German and Austrian researchers pre-World War II said, look, we know that obesity, we know that fat accumulation has huge hormonal components. You know, there's, there's men and women fatten differently. And men fatten above the waist, women fatten below the waist. That tells you that hormones are involved. Um, there are all kinds of uh, disorders called lipodystrophies, disorders of fat accumulation, where people accumulate fat in specific places but not everywhere in their body. So even if they're consuming more calories than they expend, why is it happening only in specific places on the body? There are even benign tumors called lipomas, which are tumors of fat accumulation. So clearly there are all these physiological factors that determine fat accumulation independent of how much we eat and exercise. And if it's a hormonal regulatory disorder, then what you want to know is what are the hormones and enzymes that are driving fat accumulation. And what happened, what I realized in my research, and now I'm becoming a historian, which I wasn't trained to be, but this hypothesis pretty much vanishes with the Second World War. So the German-Austrian medical community evaporates. The, there's a, the, the, the Jewish researchers are... Uh, just as they were in physics, they flee Germany and Austria, but they don't, they're not embraced in medicine the way they were embraced in physics. In physics, we had a Cold War to fight, nuclear weapons to build. And so the, and uh, in medicine, we wanted nothing to do with these people. So this theory literally evaporates, literally figuratively evaporates. And post-war, it's replaced by the calories in, calories out. Fat people get fat because they're gluttons and slothful. And it's not until the 19, not until 1960 is a tool available that allows uh, 
uh, what are endocrinologists. These are the researchers who study hormones and hormone related diseases. In 1960, a tool becomes available that allows them to measure hormones accurately in the bloodstream. And that tool revolutionizes the science of endocrinology. The researchers, well, it's invented by Rosalind Yallow and Solomon Burson. Uh, Yallow wins the Nobel Prize for it after Burson dies. And once you have that tool, you could establish what regulates fat, the, how hormones regulate fat metabolism in the human body. So you have this sort of German Austrian theory that obesity is a fat trapping disorder or a fat accumulation disorder, very simple way to look at it. And beginning in 1960, you could establish how hormones regulate fat accumulation, just like they regulate human growth or anything else. They also regulate fat accumulation. And it pretty quickly realized by 1963 that the hormone insulin is driving this process. And if you raise insulin, you're going to increase fat accumulation. And insulin responds primarily to the carbohydrate content of the diet. So by the 1960s, if you put all this together, and unfortunately, I said the German-Austrian thinking had vanished by the 1960s. And obesity research in the U.S., which was dominating the field at the time, because it hadn't been so deeply involved, I mean, it hadn't been decimated by World War II, um, the obesity research in the U.S. was dominated by psychologists and psychiatrists who saw obesity as an eating disorder and were trying to figure out how to get fat people to eat less. So they didn't pay attention to the endocrinology. They weren't trained to understand it. And so you get this endocrinological theory that it's, it's an insulin dysregulation problem. And it's being driven by the carbohydrate content of the diet. And the more refined the carbohydrates, the easier they are to digest, the more sugar they're in them, the more they're going to drive fat accumulation. And that hypothesis just, it never catches on because the people doing it have preconceptions about why fat people are fat. They think it's all about calories. They've decided by now that dietary fat is the the real danger in modern diets because it causes heart disease. So they convince themselves it causes obesity too. And you get this sort of perfect storm of bad science that leads in the 1980s to advice worldwide to eat low fat, high carbohydrate diets, which is the exact wrong thing to do if you want to uh, prevent or, or reverse obesity. So it's just one, if you don't understand the history, you can't understand what happened. And once you start to understand what happened, it, the implications are enormous. Um, then to top it all off, you've got a journalist telling doctors that they screwed up. So it's kind of a, you know, that it's been a... It's, I, was, I was going to, to, to get to this point, and thank you for, for leading um, yeah. us there. Um, you have not only been reporting this, but you have yourself become um, very much um, a, a protagonist and, 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 and opponent of, um, is it fair to say, um, a fair part of the scientific community who see you uncovering all these um, naiveties, all these um, this, um, dichotomies, um, in, in the past, um, science um, or evolving of, of science, um, and, and now suddenly it, there is this journalist, there is Gary Taubes, who speaks frankly uh, but convincingly um, about um, another hypothesis which might not be um, so wrong so far off after all. So you're, you're much, uh, very much in, in the center of, of, of a storm, aren't you? Uh, to some extent. I mean, I think most of the medical community still deals with it by just ignoring it. So, yeah, I think we'll win, especially uh, in the sense that I think events, I think the medical community will embrace these ideas, you know, my books, and they're not just my ideas, there are many other good researchers who have been coming to the same conclusions. Um, you know, my conclusions are based on the work of some excellent researchers and 
you know, there's a convergence of people looking at this. Ultimately, the medical community, the obesity research community has to shed this idea that obesity is a calorie imbalance problem. I, I describe it as very much equivalent to if we were talking about um, wealth and wealth disparities in the world. And I said, well, people like Bill Gates get so rich because they take in more money than they spend. Um, and that was my money imbalance theory of wealth. And you would say, well, that's crazy, Gary. Of course, they take in more money than they spend. That's what getting wealthy means. It's a tautology. Um, then the same logic is perfectly fits obesity. If someone's getting fatter, they have to take in more energy than they expend, but it tells you nothing about why. It just tells you getting fatter and getting heavier means they're taking in more energy than they're expending. The two things go hand in hand. So they have to dispense of some very profoundly incorrect ideas and nobody likes to think they were profoundly incorrect. You don't, I don't. We have humans have trouble dealing with that kind of cognitive dissonance as a term. So the way we deal with it is slowly to convince ourselves that we were right all along. We were just phrasing it differently, <laughs> if we were even phrasing it differently. Um, so... My role in this is interesting. I'm the provocateur. I'm, there is a tiny percentage of the medical community that is grateful for what I do and a small percent that is annoyed by what I do and just thinks I'm wrong and a the huge percent that wouldn't know my name if you, know, you drop the carton of books on their heads. Um, <clears throat> You, you just... it's, 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 it would be easier if I was a professor at Harvard. And the answer is, I don't know, because there are people in this story who are prestigious researchers who, as soon as they change the way they believe, they believe get sort of walled off by the establishment. Um, it's way, the way communities of like-minded thinkers work. And we tend to accumulate around us people who think like we do. So if anyone did this, it would be difficult. Um, being a journalist allowed me to look at this without the preconceptions of the medical community and what I was taught in med school. I also have a, Laura, I, yeah, my first book when I was living at CERN, this Nobel laureate was something of a pathological liar. His conception of truth was to whatever he th was convenient to him that he thought he could get you to believe at the time. And I got used to being lied to a lot by the very prestigious, respected scientists as I was documenting my book. Um, so I don't really have the kind of respect for authority that other journalists and that doctors and other authorities or uh, other researchers are imbued with um it makes life interesting you know it's a, a <laughs> it's it's yeah I, I it's a weird position to be in it's not where right. i ever pictured myself when i was a child that i would be the i think somebody called me the enfant terrible of nutrition and obesity science and it's uh, and it's weird it's not it's, sometimes it's fun and most of the times it's just odd. Yeah. Um, you're right. There, there are more and more um, um, senior, very um, eminent um, researchers who um, support you or who in the first place paved the way for you um, to, um, to write your books, to, to, uh, to f formulate um, uh, your um, school of thought, your hypothesis, uh, one of which um, is um, Dr. Robert Lustig. Um, I think uh, um, he has also been outspoken about something which is now your third, uh, no, sorry, your, your uh, recent, most recent book, The Case Against Sugar. And both uh, you and Dr. Lustig both um, uh, pinpoint sugar. Of course, it is a very refined carbohydrate, um, um, with um, or to the pinpointed to um, the 
um, development of um, serious disease and, uh, and um, of obesity and, and uh, the problems connected um, to start with. Well, and this is the, the issue. We know you've got this cluster of diseases that associate with obesity and diabetes and include heart disease and stroke, and they're considered sort of uh, on a population-wide basis or diseases of uh, Western diets and modern Western diets and lifestyles. They tend to be worse in urban populations and rural populations and um, you could see them emerge historically in the literature. If you again go back in the literature to look at where these, you know, these disease trends come from, and ultimately this is what we're trying to explain: this uh, emergence of obesity and diabetes and heart disease and this cluster of Western diseases in populations when they shift from their traditional diets to Western diets. And what happened in the U.S., and this was a lot of my learning experience, again, from my career and particularly the past 20 years, is about the sort of how science is done and how researchers think about science. And, and the question you ask in science is vitally important to what answer you get. And if you ask the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer. If you make the wrong observation, you'll get the wrong answer because you won't be explaining. So... <clears throat> you want to try to ask your questions with as few biases as possible. And what happened beginning in the 1950s is U.S. researchers, again, started in the U.S., spread to Europe. Um, we're asking the question, why does there appear to be an epidemic of heart disease in the U.S.? Why are middle-aged executives dropping dead of heart attacks? And their answer was, well, their arteries are clogged. This was their hypothesis. There's cholesterol in the atherosclerotic plaque, so maybe it's caused by high cholesterol. We know saturated fat raises cholesterol. And so, bingo, we can implicate saturated fat. Now we're going to go out and test that hypothesis, and it's still with us today, 60 years later. British researchers we're asking a different question. They had, the British had an advantage in a sense because they had missionary and colonial hospitals all over the remains of the British Empire, all over the world. And in all these far-flung sites, they were seeing this epidemic of obesity and diabetes and hypertension and heart disease and cerebrovascular disease emerge among their patients in these, when they became westernized, when they started interacting with the West and eating Western foods and so they were asking the question, what causes this whole cluster of diseases and what caused it everywhere? And the, the, the simplest possible answer to that was sugar. I don't think it's completely correct, but it was the simplest possible hypothesis. And it did a pretty good job when you did laboratory and small experiments with human subjects. You could pretty much... Um, replicate everything you were seeing worldwide, at least in animals and uh, humans over short periods of time by feeding them a lot of sugar. So the sugar hypothesis came up as a counter to the dietary fat hypothesis. And the dietary fat hypothesis had more supporters, it had more uh, outspoken proponents, it had more money behind it. It was a US hypothesis versus a British one. And it won. And it won not because the data supported it, because they can never actually demonstrate that it was correct experimentally, and we still don't have the evidence to do that, but because of all these political social factors that sort of built on each other, there was a kind of cascade effect in which the, you, know, you started to believe this hypothesis had to be true because your friends believed that once you believed that more and more people believed that by the 80s, we had completely embraced it. And in the process, the sugar hypothesis was treated like a fringe hypothesis supported by quacks, even though those quacks included some of the John Yudkin, who was a, arguably the leading nutritionist in Europe. Um, and by the mid-1980s, when our government started giving advice to industry to create low-fat products, the easiest way to create a tasty, low-fat product, and the classic example is yogurt, uh, you take some of the fat out. So yogurt's a food. It's not a food-like substance. 
take some of the fat out. Now you have this insipid kind of watery, low fat thing that nobody would eat. So you add back in fruit and in the US high fructose corn syrup, which is another form of sugar. And now you can market it as a heart healthy diet food. And if you sell in small portions, you could market it as a heart healthy weight loss food. <laughs> and what you've done is replace the fat with sugar. And what we saw in the US and elsewhere in the world is sugar consumption kind of exploded with the low fat dogma and the introduction of high fructose corn syrup. And people got fatter and more diabetic and heart disease incidence prevalence did not come down, even though heart disease mortality did. But that's as much as anything, the result of, you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars in pharmaceutical approaches to treating blood pressure and, and statins and surgeries and bypasses. And, um, and then you need people to sort of blow the whistle on what's happening. And so what happens is um, Robert Lustig comes along, a pediatric endocrinologist, the University of California, San Francisco, across the bay from me, and starts just saying the obvious, which is that the sugar consumption seems to be the, the huge problem. Just a lot of what we're seeing out there and as there's huge increases in obesity and diabetes and all you have to do is travel from Europe to the US to understand what the obesity epidemic looks like here. I mean, people go from being sort of normal sized <laughs> to three, four, or 500 pounders. Um, so anyway, Rob starts talking about this and he does a, uh, gives a course on it. Actually, it's a kind of night school course at UCSF and the video is about uh, sugar and it goes viral and so things start to spread from there. I was writing, researching my book and writing it as Rob started talking and our arguments coincided. So I was able as a journalist to use what Rob was doing as a member of the medical establishment to take these points about sugar and that, you know, gets back to this question of why we get fat. In the conventional thinking, sugar is bad because we eat too much of it. It's a calories, it's empty calories. And then if you think of obesity as a hormonal regulatory disorder, diabetes is clearly a hormonal regulatory disorder. What you want to know about a food or a macronutrient is how it influences hormones and enzymes and you know these fundamental regulatory systems in the human body. And in that sense, sugar is somewhat unique in how it does it. And it does it in ways that you would expect it to cause exactly what we're seeing. So you you um earlier you you mentioned that maybe um uh we uh, so this is the um, um, the science community uh, is trying to communicate too many, uh, too much information uh, too quickly, which is of course another um, another description for complexity, isn't it? Um, uh, so it's a very complex um, matter which which uh, we have before us, um, and the science principle um, is to as you say in, in one of your talks, is to explain um, what you observe uh, in, a, in a quest for understanding. It's, it's not so much um, the um, assumption that what you're um, making of something that you see is the truth, but then there is something which you, I think, refer to as establishment that very much uses this uncertainty, the complexity, which makes it hard to really um, uh, to really pinpoint the the exact processes. Um, and if you're not able to do uh, just that, then um, um, science is being used against you. Uh, and uh, and and it said that what you say is quackery is 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 not uh, is not based on scientific. Um, 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 data or, or even good practice. So there is there's a problem 
um, in which science is is used uh, as as a weapon for basically commercial interests, isn't it? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of problems with how the science is done now, and then there's a lot of uh, uh, parties with different agendas working to use the science one way or the other to either make us all healthier if that's their agenda or continue to sell their products if that's their agenda. Um, it all starts with the science. If the scientists had gotten the science right, I don't think we'd have been in this position and it was fully within their grasp to do it. Eventually, if these ideas are accepted, they'll be accepted without the acknowledgement that anybody screwed up. They'll just be accepted and people say, well, we always knew that and that's how we thought all along. And, you know, but the specific researchers, the research community did a bad job. They got the wrong answer. They went into it with preconceptions. Uh, they weren't very, they weren't really trained to be rigorous scientists. They didn't have the culture of critical thinking that they needed to attack the problem. They might have, some of them were wonderful physicians and uh, great doctors, but they were, you know, it's a different skill set, different way of thinking to do science. Um, and then the funding in science is such that, uh, and this began in the post-war years in the U.S. when the government got into funding science and the idea very uh, concretely was to fund as many researchers as to fund a, 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 a wide swath of the research community. So instead of doing what we did in the Manhattan Project, for instance, where you give a, basically, you know, we need to create atomic bombs, so here's all the money you need, and you get all the best scientists together. Once the Manhattan Project was over, the idea was we have scientists all over the country and all over the world, and we're, all, we're gonna give them what they need. They'll, they'll write proposals to pursue what they think is interesting. And now you have a very uh, diffuse approach, and the idea is from that diff diffusion, you're supposed to get great ideas bubbling up. But there's no way to capture those ideas and then fully funnel them into attacking big problems. And in nutrition and obesity, what happened is because you're funding people to do 50, 100, 2,000 different approaches, you conclude it's a very complex problem. So everyone's has to break it into little simple pieces, little sub-sub-disciplines that they can make progress. And then you decide that each, every little iota of knowledge that's coming out of those sub-disciplines is meaningful to the big problem. And you end up with this idea that the phrase you hear a lot, it's a multifactorial complex problem and there are all these different factors involved. There are a lot of factors involved, but ultimately, the um, you lose the the necessary scientific approach, which is it's called Occam's razor, which is you assume it's simple until you have to complicate it. If you can't explain what you see, the observation with the simple hypothesis, and move to the next simplest and see if that works. And then move if it doesn't, you know, eventually you get to the correct level of explanation. Einstein said a was paraphrased as saying a uh, uh, hypothesis should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that's what you work to. Here you've got a situation where you've got hundreds of thousands of researchers being funded to look at hundreds of thousands of different things and everything seems very complex and you wanna treat every possibility as equally valid and no progress can be made. And then it opens the door as obesity and diabetes rates climb. It opens the door to every quack who's got a solution, every journalist who thinks he's got a solution. And every industry can see in the data what they need to defend their position. And no meaningful progress is made while, you know, billions of dollars are still being spent on research. It's, it's a, a mess of a situation. Into this, you add the media, which has a vested interest to take the sort of newest, most counterintuitive of all the ideas and promote those as though they're real when they're the least likely to be real. Um, and uh, it's kind of a, a mess that there, there may ultimately be no cleaning, no process to just throw it all out and start again.
the the question I was trying to raise is this vested interests which you have um, which you have um, said uh, are, are with the media they have a vested interest but there are other and uh, maybe even stronger vested interests in, involved uh, and, and in your book the case against sugar you briefly touch on uh, uh, on, a, on a very very interesting match between two industries where over here we would have thought that tobacco was the worst um, but in fact what uh, you are uh, at least um, insinuating is that maybe uh, tobacco only got uh, as bad as it uh, is um, due to uh, with sugar so these two industries at least they 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 are able to pull a few strings in regulation in science um, and they have done so at least in sugar that's what 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 you and your um, uh, and your colleagues have have found out maybe you can give us a bit uh, of, of, of detail here well so the sugar industry will leave the cigarette sugar connection aside for a moment just talk about the sugar industries problem. So they have one product that they produce is sugar and it's an extraordinarily successful product and we love it, whether it's addictive or not. You know, clearly people love it. And so sugar, uh, historically populations will consume as much sugar as they can afford. And uh, as production costs for sugar got cheaper and cheaper, sugar consumption went up and up. And then you had this food industries that specialized in turning sugar into products that we would maximally consume. So candy industry and the ice cream industry and the chocolate industry and then the soft drink industry. This is all in the 19th century. And then the sugary cereal industry and the fruit juice industry and the, the sports drink industry and all packaging sugar in a way to get us to consume it. Um, as the research started to develop implicating sugar and disease, it was, like I said, it was a very fringe position. It may be 1% of active nutritionists and in in medical researchers in the 1960s believed it was sugar and not fat that was the problem. So what do you do if you're the sugar industry? I mean, that's all you market is sugar. You can't, so the beverage industry can start the Coca-Colas and PepsiCo's can start selling diet Cokes and diet Pepsi's and using artificial sweeteners, but the sugar industry can't do that. All they've got is sugar. And they've got a consensus of opinion that the problem with modern diets is fat. They've got researchers who are actually saying sugar is great because it's actually the cheapest calories. So if you have people going through famines in the world, the, you know, sugar is an easy way to get them energy. And then you've got this tiny fringe community that um, says it's toxic, it's not fat, it's killing people. We have to, writing books with titles like Sweet and Dangerous. Um, so the sugar industry does, I think, what anyone would do under those circumstances. This is why I don't hold them as responsible as I hold the tobacco industry or the researchers at the heart of it, is they uh, basically start spending money on public relations campaigns to remind nutritionists and obesity researchers that what they've been saying in general is true of sugar in particular, that if obesity is all about eating too much and too many calories, then it's, there's nothing unique about sugar other than that people like it. You can't regulate or legislate away a product just because people like it. And if dietary fat's the problem, if that's causing heart disease and obesity, then sugar's benign. And so they create a very well-structured public relations campaign. They actually won a sort of the public relations world's version of an Oscar for this campaign to convince the world that sugar is harmless because the nutrition and obesity researchers thought it was. So in that sense, they were very different from the cigarette industry. They were self-interested. They were working for the benefit of their industry, but they maybe rightly believed that the, you know, the, the people who thought sugar was toxic were, were can, perceived as quacks. So they just had to get the conventional scientists, the establishment to accept that what they were saying was true, and that they really believed it. Um, 
the tobacco industry was doing something different. They were trying to convince the world that what the science, that the science showed something that it didn't show. You know, that cigarettes weren't addictive, that cigarettes didn't cause lung cancer, when there was already pretty compelling evidence and a consensus of opinion that it was addictive and it did cause lung cancer. That was a much more malicious uh, industry in that sense. I don't see them as equivalent. I see the sugar industry as doing what I, and most of us would do in that situation. But the tobacco people were evil. <laughs> Um, but there, there is the same um, thing being said about um, sugar, um, it being addictive, um, the way it works in the brain and the nucleus accumbens and, and, and stuff. Um, Robert Lustig in his, in his latest book is, is, uh, is making a fascinating um, uh, um, scenario as to how this basic principle from sugar um, and causing addictiveness um, goes on to to various um, areas of our modern life. So, but, but so there is the same um, um, being said about um, sugar. And then, um, if this were true, and um, if uh, we consider that maybe um, those in the industry um, knew also knew fairly. Uh, early about um, the problems with their product, so then they, they they may be not so much different after all. Yeah, although I don't know what. Um, I, and I, I again on this issue of sugar being addictive. If you've got, if you're a parent and you have children, I don't need uh, fancy science to show that this product has a hold over their brains that no other product does. Um, you know, you, the only things you have to ration and, and as a parent in modern lives are sugar consumption and screen time, which is interesting. And it's probably a point Rob is making in his book that, you know, we've got an experimental, we're raising an experimental generation of children who, you know, God knows what damage will be done from their screen addictions, or maybe it'll be a good thing. But the point is, from the there was never any serious discussion of sugar as an addictive substance from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Only recently, there was in the U.S. There was only really one laboratory studying it at Princeton. They weren't, yeah, you know, they were pretty good, but they weren't very sophisticated in how they were looking at it. There was a laboratory in France, a few labs around the world that were asking this question. Um, like I said, it, it's a question, my, my favorite line on this is from an author who's a good friend of mine, a wonderful author named Charles Mann, who in his book 1493 said, today scientists debate among themselves whether sugar is an addictive substance or people just act like it is. And it almost doesn't matter on that sense. You know, the idea that we're going to regulate it because we could demonstrate by some criteria that it is physically addictive when, like I said, clearly all you have to do is give your kids sugar to see that it's a psychoactive, certainly, and that they want to repeat the experience, certainly, and that they want to, if you give them a choice between a sugary substance and a non-sugary substance, they will choose the sugary substance, and they could have complete awareness that sugar is harmful to them, as I think my children do, and still be helpless to turn it away if offered at a party or, you know. Um, so there's, uh, it's almost a moot point to me. The question is, and clearly when you read the sugar industry documents, you look at the history of companies like Coca-Cola, these people thought that they had God's gift to humanity. You know, what that there was, America's gift to humanity was Coca-Cola. And those of us growing up in the 60s and 70s probably believed they were right. You know, there was no single substance in the world that was as pleasurable as Coca-Cola um, on a hot day to a thirsty person. And so, they didn't have the kind of evidence, and it was harder to get the kind of evidence to demonstrate that these were harmful products. 
and you don't see the obesity and diabetes epidemics. You have to, you don't see them day to day. Like if there's an Ebola epidemic and you're watching your friends get sick and keel over and die, that's, that's something you can witness and observe and react to. But these chronic disease epidemics take years to decades. And it's hard to, even if you witness them and you say, hey, everyone's getting fatter, it's hard to actually see to, you know, the best you can come up with are the hypotheses of causation. It's not like you see somebody drink a Coca-Cola or put sugar on their cereal and the next day they're obese. Um, so the, the cause is separated from the effect. So it's, um, I don't know what the right thing for the sugar industry to have done is. I still don't know what it is. Um, in my world, they would be saying, you know, it's, these are really serious charges against us. Let's spend the money necessary to see if they're right. And then I try to think of mechanisms by which that could be done, that the research could be done to establish unambiguously whether the charges that Rob Lustig makes, the charges I make are really true. And then if they are, what do you do about it? But as long as it's, I'll give you, I'll give you another example. I actually think red meat is benign. In fact, I think there are many people in the world who, in order to be healthy, have to have meat-rich, animal-rich products. But what used to be conventional wisdom has now become a minority perspective. And I have allies in the sugar world who would like to regulate meat consumption out of our diets, who think the, we should all be eating vegetarian diets and that this is the healthiest way to eat, the healthiest thing for the planet, certainly the healthiest thing for the animals. And um, that the meat industry is as bad as the sugar industry, which is as bad as the tobacco industry. And just because we agree on sugar, I mean, you have to take the big picture. So if we just, if we, Decide sugars as bad as the tobacco industry. What are we going to do about the meat industry, which I think and they think are doing good in the world, not to the animals, but to the people who get to eat them? Uh, it's just, it's inevitably, there's a lot of naive, simplistic thinking. And I, I don't think we, we benefit ourselves or our society if we embrace. Yeah, fair point. Fair point you're making. Gary, um, to, to to close our discussion, which um, I would love to for it to go on um, on and on because it's it's fascinating um, to hear you talk about this and, and to pick your brains on this. But um, let, let's come back to to health and um, to uh, what is uh, as you say or write in your book. What's what is the nature of a healthy diet um, in your view? Is it is it um, is it possible? Uh, yeah, well, um, and it's interesting about complexity, we'd have to describe healthy. <laughs> so we could say, what's the nature of an unhealthy diet? And I would argue it starts with a diet that has significant sugar and refined grains in it. Um, so the arguments I make in my book are that this cluster of diseases that associate with each other, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cancer, maybe Alzheimer's, you know, inflammation as a symptom of those diseases, and it all fundamentally is caused by sugar and refined grains. Uh, I have friends I respect who think vegetable oils are equally responsible. I'm not, don't find that data as compelling. So a healthy diet begins by removing first the sugars, the sugary beverages, which includes fruit juices, and then ideally the highly refined grains. So you're left with uh, some starchy vegetables and relatively unrefined grains. Um, and that would be a healthy enough diet. And then a lot of green vegetables and I think animal products are good for us. But like I said, I'm, that's a, uh, becoming a minority opinion. The uh, if you're on this spectrum from sort of 
what's called metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, uh, where you're getting from, say, overweight to obesity and pre-diabetes to diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which now is uh, more than half of all Americans and probably a significant portion of Euro Europeans. And the question is, should you be eating, you know, the, the further you are along that spectrum, the fewer carbohydrates you want to be consuming. The so then you get the starchy vegetables, the potatoes, and the unrefined carbs out of the diet. And you can, I believe, return to, to some semblance of metabolic health. But the conventional thinking is, right, it's fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean protein in moderation, alcohol in moderation, um, sweets in moderation. And then this alternative perspective is you get rid of the the sugar, the refined grains, much of the grains and starches completely, and you're left with green vegetables and a uh, lot of animal products, um, eggs, dairy, meat, fish, fowl. Um, fats come from animal products or naturally occurring animal fats. Stay away from vegetable oils. So it's not as easy a question and it depends on what type of individual we're talking about. But ultimately, it's get rid of the sugar, get rid of the refined grains, the wheat products, and you're at least eating a much healthier diet. Well, thank you very much, Gary Tops. This was a um, fascinating tour d'horizon. Um, um, for almost um, an hour, uh, we have been discussing your two books basically uh, the one which uh, is called why we get fat um is just um on the shelves um, in german bookstores uh, and the recent book of yours the case against sugar hopefully um we will also have the uh, pleasure to to be reading it in, in german language because not everyone is able um to 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 read it in, in english it's a very um, complex, um, it's a complex uh, um, issue. It's 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 a very fun read. I, I can say I've, I've read it, but it's a complex issue. So therefore, um, let's hope to get it uh, also in in the German language soon. I, have any dates set for that? Do you know about it? Uh, I do not know at the time. I have a vague memory that there's a German edition coming. So, but I don't know when. We we should hope so because it's a very very fascinating books as are all of uh, your your books uh, thank you for this talk i'm gary taubs all the best to you and uh, bye bye okay thank you okay